Welcome to the conversation on medical marijuana and the evaluation of health, health and wellness rather derived from cannabis. We'll also be covering investment opportunities in the rapidly evolving and exponentially growing world of cannabis. My name is Tara Kelly, and I'm the president of the North American division of Ghost Vapes, a company that is advancing medical innovation in the vaporizer market and which hopes to help push forward the medical research movement related to cannabis. We will be introducing our first vaporizer into the marketplace in early June. I'm joined on stage today by Lynn Hondred, co-founder and CEO of Mary's Medicinals, Mary's Nutritionals, and Mary's Pets, a company that is opening access to medical marijuana for a whole universe of people and pets. Juan Sartori is um, sitting next, seated next to Lynn, and he's the founder and chairman of Union Group, which is a holding company focused on commodities um, that also happens to be a shareholder and in International Cannabis Corporation, which is the world's largest grower and exporter of cannabis. We're also joined by Ben um, Kovler, who is the chairman and CTO of GTI, which is a large owner of dispensary licenses. And we also have Brian Reynolds, who's the founder and managing partner of Chatham Capital. Ben, if you'd like uh, to start, I would love to hear a little bit more about um, your business and your focus in cannabis. And if you could also tell us about what motivated you to get in the space, it would be wonderful to learn more. Sure, great. Thank you. Thanks everybody for being here. Uh, thanks to the Milken Institute for having another panel on medical cannabis, an important topic. So I'll just set the stage real quick and respond to that. So who we are, so my name is Ben Kovler, uh, founder and CEO of Green Thumb Industries. We have 11 licenses around five different states around the country to cultivate, dispense, process, distribute medical cannabis. Uh, let's just go over some vocabulary. Cultivation is the kind of license that some states give out to grow the plants. This is usually indoor, sometimes outdoor. Processing is taking the plant matter into oil or other kind of extracted products, vapes, edibles, tinctures, patches, any one of a thousand different things, and that category is exploding. And then distribution, some states have a third party distribution, and some states have a direct, but then to a dispensary. Dispensary is the word for a store or a patient, or in states where recreational marijuana exists, a customer goes in and buys uh, medical cannabis. So with those sort of in line, we operate in Illinois, Nevada, Massachusetts, Maryland, uh, and studying several other states as they come online. Uh, a little bit about the motivation. This is medical marijuana. It's quite interesting walking around the panel, being around here. Our business sits right in the crosshairs of several different issues that we think are incredibly important. The first of which is the opiate epidemic, the monstrous amount of deaths, overdoses that are happening to people every day. Last year, I think, or a few years ago, was the first year that the opiate deaths, opiate-related deaths were the number one, uh, crossed auto deaths over 30,000 people. Uh, and then, the icing on the cake here is in states with a legal medical marijuana program, you have 25% less opiate-related deaths. That's real data. I'm not a doctor. I have never done any kind of medical studies. Uh, that's the macro backdrop I operate in. And then on the micro and the anecdotal, we operate these stores. I have patients coming in every day. In, in Illinois, it's not California. For many of you, maybe in California, where you can go around and get a doctor to sign it you've never met. Does not exist in Illinois. That's not the way it goes. You have sick people who are on pharmaceutical drugs that they do not want to be on anymore, and they're getting relief from cannabis. Overwhelming anecdotal evidence in our store. Half the people that come in have never tried cannabis. So it's a, sort of that backdrop, uh, and, and also the crosshairs of broken, financially upside down municipalities who need jobs. We sit right there. So that motivated me. I like puzzles and games and problems, and so this sets up exactly like that. And so we operate in tightly regulated markets where we can understand supply and demand. Controlled supply sets up favorably for us. The underlying thesis of our whole business is a tidal wave of demand. That's what we think is happening here for several different reasons. We get the license, we get open, and then we optimize and operate. And last question, just that everybody's asked me at this conference, we are banked. We are legally banked. We're in several banks. We have seven or eight bank accounts across the country. <coughs> We're compliant, they know what we're doing. There's a lot of compliance. Um, my old uh, career in the hedge fund business, there used to be a lot of compliance. This is that times 10, uh, but we're happy to do it. We need to have payroll, 401k, withholding, et cetera. So thank you. Brian, would you look, like to tell a little sure. bit about what, how you got into the space? Sure, I'm um, Brian Reynolds and I'm with Chatham Capital. Um, and initially I got involved um, I'm on the Epilepsy Foundation board in, um, in Atlanta, and I got interested in, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a little bit with um, 
and then I, I invested in uh, Rhode Island with uh, Catino Mobley, and, uh, and then I invested in uh, Colorado with um, Harmony and, and uh, Alpine, and then I invested in um, Malibu Capital Coalition, and Malibu Capital Coalition with Catino Mobley <coughs> has uh, 40,000 square feet in Humboldt, the uh, first licensed uh, indoor facility there, and then um, we have a transaction with the Cabazon Indian Tribe uh, down in uh, Indio, California, next to Coachella, and then um, in um, and then we also have a, a dispensary in Malibu, and so um, so I got involved. And in, um, you know, if you look at if you pull up the slide on uh, medical marijuana being treatment program um, in Atlanta. Um, Sanjay Gupta is there, and he did a um, he did a uh, documentary on Charlotte and Charlotte's Web, and everybody's got some information on that here. Everybody's involved with that, and her uh, Paige Fiji, her daughter, was about dead, and um, she uh, she's having thousands of seizures a day, and um, she uh, she her her mother was very conservative was not going to do anything in marijuana and she decided to do it because she was almost dead she, and uh, not eating, um, not drinking, mentally not developing and um, she took the C CBD and which is now known as Charlotte's Web and, um, and miraculously her seizures declined enormously and I see her you know on Facebook every day having a, running around and enjoying uh, enjoying life, going to school, and development to be a little bit behind, but um, you know, but but a significant um, thing in, in um, cannabis and um, CBDs. Um, Paige, the mother, has gone around and helped all the states get uh, legal medical marijuana. She's lobbied at the congressional level. Uh, Paul Ryan's on board with with um, eventually getting something done there. Uh, senators from Georgia, uh, a bunch of senators that are interested in in getting something legal there, and um, so she helped in in Georgia when the Epilepsy Foundation board was uh, lobbying to get it done in Georgia. She came down, and you know we got all the kids on the on the courthouse steps and lobbied to get the uh, get the stigmas out of people's heads and getting that done. So that, that's kind of how I got involved, Tara. Th thank you for sharing that. And Lynn, why don't you tell us a little bit about sure, thank Mary's you. Medicinals? Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Lynn Hondard. I'm CEO of Mary's Medicinals, Nutritionals, and Pets. Um, we started the company in 2013 in Colorado. Uh, we came out with the first transdermal application of cannabis, um, which is very exciting for us. Since then, we operate in eight states, soon to be 12. Uh, we have 10 different products out on the marketplace and over 30, 32 different SKUs. Uh, and we also started a company called Mary's Nutritionals in 2015, um, where it's high, highly rich CBD um, without THC. So it's an international and national shipping um, product compliant. Um, I got into the business. My background is finance, so it was really odd to be in this business because it's such an altruistic uh, um, environment and industry industry, but I got into it looking at the marketplace and recognizing that there's not, at the time, which was four years ago, there wasn't a widely available application of cannabis use um, that mainstream America would believe in. And so by putting a patch into the marketplace, people could relate to that and they could look at cannabis as an opportunity to enter into the space using it, but in something that they could believe in. It wasn't a vape or a, a joint or a bong head. Um, it was something that they could really look at and say, this could help me. Um, and so that's how we entered the marketplace. We went with a, um, a brand that is simply black and white. We adhere to five key pillars. It's accurately dosed, discreet use, uh, clean delivery mechanisms, and a patient first mentality. Um, it would be remiss of me not to say I went into it from a capitalistic standpoint uh, because that is my background. Uh, however, it, that changed instantaneously um, and pretty much overnight. And I say this a lot and I truly mean it. I think it's one of the in only industries that you can really find a marriage of capitalism and altruism. And that's kind of hard to do in a lot of different industries. Thank you for sharing Thank that. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I, I'm, I'm Juan Sartori. I'm the founder of Union Group. We're a company uh, operating across mainly natural resources and, and infrastructure 
uh, in all of Latin America. Um, what's interesting is we, we own one of the largest agricultural companies in, uh, in South America, providing things like soybean, uh, rice, and very, very standard traditional agricultural goods. And, and around uh, five years ago, um, my country, Uruguay, decided to be the first one to legalize uh, cannabis, both for recreational and medicinal purposes. It was a, a very big, uh, big news. And originally, the, the government wanted us to start growing that. And having a lot of institutional investors, being a large company, we said, we don't want to have anything to do with that. Uh, I personally said, there's no way I can explain my mother that I'm going to get into that, <laughs> into that business. But it was a mistake, because several years uh, later, we realized the, the potential of, uh, of this uh, opportunity. It ended up costing us much more expensive to get into the, into the business, but we ended up acquiring one of the first uh, licenses uh, given in, in Uruguay to, to produce cannabis. And the thought process there was very much driven to what's going on uh, internationally. You really have only three countries in the world who have legalized uh, production in different ways. The United States at a state level, but the federal border is still illegal. We can discuss for, for how long. So it means that all the production here cannot go internationally and cannot even cross to a different state. So it's a specific opportunity, very internal uh, domestic market for, for you. The other country is Canada. They legalize it medically. They are now going for a recreational use. And they produce, but the current producers there cannot meet even a small percentage of the demand that is, uh, is going to be generated in that country. And the third country is, uh, is Uruguay, uh, full legalization of production. But what's happening on the other side is that most countries, and, and this is driven but by what's easier to do for a politician. When you see cases like, like Charlotte, when you see the evidence that the, the medical impact of marijuana has on, on children, on people, it's difficult not to legalize the medical use with some prescription or with some controls. So in the last uh, uh, three months, we have seen uh, Germany uh, legalizing. We have seen uh, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, just to talk about, uh, about my, my part of the world. So what's happening internationally is that the demand and the legal demand is now probably three to 400 million people. But because of the regulatory bars to entry, there's almost nobody who can produce it. So for us in, in, in Uruguay, what we are focusing on is being a low-cost producer and exporter of, um, of medical or recreational marijuana to these uh, new countries that are legalizing it. And that's for us a, a very interesting opportunity driven by a regulatory uh, advantage. And is the reason why we can get a bit more into, into the, the aspects, but why we, we are very excited about this company we are simply an investor in called the International Cannabis Corporation. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. It's so funny to see so many traditional finance backgrounds. My background is actually uh, macroeconomics. Um, so we're all in this space. We're all excited about it. And Mary, uh, Lynn, rather, I echo your sentiments. I was thinking about your medicinal um, company, um, that there is not a space that I can find where you can affect the lives of so many people and you can deploy capital for social good in the way that cannabis um, seems to be that place right now. Can you tell us a little bit more about the receptivity in the medical community to cannabis and the applications of cannabis? Sure. I think it's growing um, leaps and bounds. And it's interesting because this <coughs> industry is moving so fast, and we always say we're building the plane while we're flying it, and, and that's the case with um, medical professionals as well, really trying to dive into the space and see um, their thought process on it. We work a lot with um, American uh, Nurses for Safe Access. We work um, a lot with uh, different epilepsy groups um, where doctors come in and, and nurses come in and earn extra credit learning about um, the use of cannabis in, in the space. And I think depending on the state that you're in, um, in particular, and the, um, the thought process that doctors have in their, you know, their um, ability to accept cannabis use, it's definitely growing. In Colorado, you see it everywhere, and it's, it's so um, well spoken of, whether you're talking to your oncologist or you're talking to your, um, even your general practitioner, and, and changing the subject of using cannabis not as a reactive approach, but a proactive approach and a daily lifestyle. And it should be something considered as a multivitamin, and it should be considered to be used as an ongoing daily um, basis. What we do need is more research in the states. Um, a lot of research is happening in Israel and in other countries, which is terrific, um, but there's not much research happening here in the States. And I think um, to get your um, doctors on board even more so, it, the research needs to happen here. So we've kind of set the stage for all the enthusiasm that's happening and also the capital that 
Maybe it's not yet being deployed in the space, but it's certainly looking at the space. Um, we also exist in a time when polling data shows that um, anywhere between 70 to 90 percent of Americans are in favor of medical marijuana being legalized, and um, legalization efforts on the recreational side are trending above 60 percent. So as we exist within that world, and 28 states have gone legal, let's talk a little bit more about um, how we reconcile. So, so again, there's all this excitement. Um, there's also there are recent updates um, related to Attorney General Sessions meeting with Gov Governor Hickenlooper of Colorado and sort of messaging to him that he was not going to move to enforce uh, federally uh, regulated um, laws related to medical cannabis, or federal laws rather, around uh, medical cannabis. Um, so there's all this good news, yet it remains a class one scheduled illegal drug from a federal perspective. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you reconcile some of the new developments that are happening, but also the fact that it's still a federally illegal drug? Sure. Um, yeah, a very complex situation. Federally illegal, very hard to operate, lots of challenges. At the end of the day, making people's lives a lot better. I mean, it's as simple as black and white, right? People are dying from these other pills that doctors are giving them that they get their insurance to pay for, or they come out of pocket, federally illegal, not in an insurance program, no prescription, and get this and improve their lives. And so I'm a student of the market. We believe market demand finds supply. The really cool thing that's happening now is the supply is getting better. Innovation, investment, I mean, this is capitalism. So there's a huge moat around our business. There's major barriers to entry. There's monstrous fear. There's absolutely no information out there. So that's a, a good um, recipe for opportunity and for you know, monumental returns. But you have federal illegality, you have federal raids, uh, you have lots of things going on, ATF, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we study the law very, very carefully. There's ways to operate so we don't operate in places of gray market, like California or Michigan. It's a little gray for us. We need to be following state laws. We need to be abiding by the Cole Memo. We need to understand FinCEN. We need to know the top regulators and have comfort that we're operating by the rules with a license in a state-regulated environment. The gray markets are over. One by one, I mean, to your point, like the tipping point has happened. If you look at the, the adoption curve, like we are there. Um, and so that's what we spend all day, every day studying and understanding and being super careful uh, and studying the transcripts and reading everything they're saying um, and trying to help and trying to be an ally here. So I think, yeah, I think when you, when you look at this slide, there's 59% of the U.S. population, 190 million people are covered um, by medical marijuana today. And so, the, you know, it's a, uh, there's a manifest destiny here that, that this will get, you know, eventually legal. You know, we've got 29 states, 35, 36, 37, 70 percent of the um, states legal medically. That will probably be a tipping point somewhere around there. And, you know, it's a $70 billion business that's uh, illegal, mostly. So it's a $4 billion business today. <clears throat> and seventy billion dollars, and there's just a conversion that has to go on between the legal part and the illegal part, and so there'll be more and more um, of that going on, and growth in in the marketplace because of that. So it's a uh, it's here to stay, and and it's it's going to accelerate, and um, you know guys like these that are on the panel here are people that are on the forefront of that, and will do very well with that. Thank you. It, it's really interesting because it does seem like the genie's sort of out of the bottle, and it's going to be really hard to stem the tide. Um, but in the here and now, Ben, you had mentioned that your business is fully banked. Can you talk to us a little bit more about how you've navigated the maze of some of the regulation around traditional banking and how the cannabis sector is, has been primarily unbanked? Uh, yes. So there's guidance from the federal government. Uh, it's left over from the old administration that's now been recently extended. Uh, something called the Cole Memo for how to operate within a bank. So Bank America, Citibank, JP Morgan, no, they're not going to touch this. We operate in state chartered banks, 50 to a billion dollars, 50 million at the low end, a billion dollars, billion three is our largest relationship, uh, where you have to have an understanding with your banker. The board has to say they're okay with this. They have to understand the regulations, but they have upside. We have a lot of business. Uh, and, and by banking, let's just be real here. All I'm talking about is an account, a checking account to payroll. Forget credit. There is no traditional financing in the U.S. for this. Zip. 
Um, so we're just talking about it like an account to pay payroll. I have employees being kicked out of their banks because they're getting payroll from a medical cannabis company, fully legal. Um, but they're, that happens about once a month. You know, we have 80, 90 employees, so not uncommon. Uh, but we're very upfront with the bank. We believe they are our partners. Uh, we applaud the bankers who are taking a step out there trying to do this because let's be real, us running around with huge sums of cash is a bad scenario. Nobody wants it. No governor wants it. No state police. Nobody wants it. We don't want it. So we're not doing it. Um, and if you can have a rational conversation with somebody about that, you can figure out a solution. But it's hard in the first states. Colorado, California, gray market, no legal. I mean, somebody in California walks up to a bank with $150,000 from a nice day at the retail store. There's a lot of conversations that have to happen there. There's no state license. That doesn't happen in Illinois that way. That doesn't happen in Massachusetts. It doesn't happen in Nevada. It doesn't happen in Maryland, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, you know, the, uh, in California, they're, they're meeting uh, six times a year to um, Mona Mee, uh, who's looking to be treasurer of, of the state of California, is working with you know, the, the AG, um, Treasury, um, agriculture, all the different groups to get a, um, a coherent banking system in California. And so it's being worked on, you know, as we speak, and it's being worked on feverishly. So something will happen there also. And, and, and eventually this will, you know, be like uh, California, which is the sixth largest economy in the world. You know, there's, there's five countries bigger than it, and, then, and it's a country by itself almost. Okay. And, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the commerce that will be there will be enormous, and so the, they're working on it. Um, for example, um, there's, there's a, uh, uh, San Francisco is a sanctuary city for cannabis. They, there's no prosecution there. They can, they can do things there that you can't do at uh, most other places. And um, so it's developing over time, and we're going to see some uh, progress on that. And Mary, do you have any added thoughts as an operator um, from how you, how you ch manage the challenges of the banking sector? Sure, it's difficult. We have, we're fully banked as well. Um, we work with a, a credit union in Denver. Um, it took us five different banks and personal <coughs> accounts being shut down as well as business accounts being shut down to finally go through the due diligence process to get in with this bank. Um, great business for them to be in ancillary business, they, they rake you over the coals in fees, but the nice thing about it is we're not carrying 150 grand around every day, and um, having the safety issue is, is far more important. Um, for us in particular, as, a, as an operator of a business, and we employ 30-some employees and are continuing to grow, um, there's other hurdles. It's whether or not we can get direct deposit and how often we have to have that up and running. Um, our 401k has been shut down four different times. Um, the bigger issue, and I think it, this might lead into the segue of investment potentially, is the 280E tax implications that are imposed on our industry. Um, you know, here we are in this, this huge opportunity for growth. Um, and Ben and I talked about this the other day, is that yes, there's this great opportunity and it is the green rush and all of those things, especially when it looks at supply and demand for it. Um, but when you start getting down into the financials and the nitty gritty and you look at what can't be deducted, um, and the tax implications that you're, you're faced with, it's, it's a different story altogether. Um, and it's how you navigate that and, and get that changed, hopefully, to continue the growth and get medicine into the people's hands that need it. Yeah, as, as an operator um, myself, I was so surprised to learn that things like payroll services, you know, like they look at you very deeply and we don't touch um, the plan in any way, but we went through, under, we went, underwent the same uh, scrutiny that someone who um, does would. And I was just really surprised to learn that myself. Very difficult. Um, so great. Do you guys want to talk a little bit more about kind of the investment opportunities that you see in the space and what you're really excited about? Sure. I mean, there's massive opportunity. I would say, like in everything you do, the people you invest with are the most important, like in everything. Um, and here, just study. I mean, I can talk about, obviously, our business we think is an excellent investment, but I'm not up here to talk about that. I think I would advise understanding where you're investing and how that's looking. So. Our thesis, tidal wave of demand. What does that actually mean, right? What does the pie look like? A 50 billion, 70 billion, 100 billion. How much is flour? How much are these other things? Flour is the, the term that was, you know, marijuana in a baggie. It's now called flour. It's no longer called pot or bud or any of that. Um, we are huge believers in brands. We think this is a brand game. We think we've seen this movie before. Like the expression in our office is, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes. This is what's happening. This has happened before. And so if, by studying that, you can figure out where to allocate capital for juicy returns. 
It's not an ego game. It's not a market share game. It's return on invested capital. So we understand that. Some people understand that. A lot of people don't. There's going to be massive carnage. Uh, the cannabis time goes super fast. So there's already distressed assets. There's people busted out over and over again, all the time. Be careful, be prudent, and again, just the people you invest with are the most important thing, because this is illegal. There's a lot of trust that has to happen here, and whatever's in the document, you gotta trust who you put capital with. I think when you look at the, uh, the economics of it, you know, it costs about five to 700 a pound to produce, and at retail, um, they sell it an eighth of an ounce. At retail, it's uh, going for $5,000 a pound. So that's a pretty good margin. So um, people that are vertically integrated, you know, do very well, and um, and will probably be able to withstand any uh, price reductions in, in the marketplace if you control your own supply. So I think Ben does here. So. I think that segues maybe Juan. You could talk about just you're at massive scale and yeah. a little bit of pricing and how that looks from your world. Yeah, when I mean when, when you look at it historically, you had a, only a, a, a couple of cases of a product that is already consumed. That is a large product of this scale that overnight becomes illegal. You, of course, here you had the, the prohibition, and immediately became the large uh, producers there. But uh, in some in some aspects, also the gambling authorizations or gambling licenses in certain states this is a similar analysis you can you can you can look at. There's no doubt because of the market size uh, that. In three to five years, you will have several $10 billion companies that are cannabis companies. The key is which ones are going to be the, the winners and what allows you to create barriers to entry. In the, in the first phase, if you simply have a license to produce, you'll be able to dictate prices. Um, 11 license, whatever, every single license today is a, is a license to print money because the demand is there and you are the only one who is protected. In the second case, probably the extraction, the processing, the transforming that into an added value, a product becomes a little bit more uh, interesting. And then in the last one is the branding. If you're talking 15, 20 years from now, definitely the, the Marlboro of cannabis is going to be the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest company. And, and here, the, the examples of what companies look like is that you have um, a recreational side. Is, uh, in technical terms, in the cannabis, you have the THC is what gets you high, and the CBD is what has the medical uh, impact. So on the THC business, you can be like, an, like a beer company or like um, a tobacco company. On the medicinal side, on CBD, you're going to have several pharmaceutical companies that either through patents or a very low cost of production are going to be the, the winners. But, but I, I'm, I believe, and that was my, my choice in the investment, that in the, this very first inning, whoever has a license to produce and can ramp up production quickly, is going to be probably one of the of the winners when when you see some of the listed companies and this is a sector that already has several billion dollar listed companies in terms of, of market cap we can talk about it are the ones who have been able to secure the maximum capacity earlier and not necessarily those who have the higher uh, revenues or, or something like that and Juan, you have an incredibly unique vantage point and the seat that you sit in as a grower and exporter, the fact that you grow in Uruguay and you export internationally. Can you tell us a little bit more about what your forecast is for how dynamics continue to change globally? Yeah, remember the company is listed, so I cannot be too, too specific. But wh what's happening in the, in the last three months in my, uh, Germany is a country of 50 million people, very obviously um, with high uh, purchase uh, capacity that just legalized medical uh, consumption. Uh, so have um, countries like Brazil, 100 million people, like Mexico last weekend. So all of those uh, markets together are right now and almost overnight, if you're talking a period of, of three months, a potential uh, around $12 billion uh, market. The key is uh, who can provide it and all the administrative barriers that, like in the U.S., even though it sounds uh, uh, easy, you still have in cross-border import-export of these uh, products very, very tough administrative or, or, or legal, legal challenges. So today, if, uh, for example, today, we, we can produce as much as we can, and it's not enough to meet even the, the short-term demand. So the big challenge is going to be in being able to increase uh, capacity of production in an industrial way, in a controlled uh, way, uh, to levels that are uh, very high levels of growth with, with high operational uh, risk, like, like Brian was mentioning because we, we've seen that in, in some cases in the United States also. Great. 
And as this is a very new and uh, transitioning space, we've sort of talked about the numbers in a roundabout way, um, but ac accurate market data is a little bit hard to quantify. I'd love to go around the panel and get a read on what everyone thinks as far as the market opportunity sizes and also the breakdown of medical um, and, and legal. So, uh, you want to no, go ahead, Brian. Yeah. So, um, if you if you look at the uh, market overview slide here, you can see that the estimated demand for um, recreational cannabis and and um, medical cannabis is 40 to 45 billion, which is above wine and um, just below beer. And so, um, you can you can see if the slide was up there, you could see. There, so you can see that the, you know where it fits in the in the overall market. So um, you know it's going to be a significant market, and um, and uh, it's continuing and and will will get adopted. Um, even in the uh, the last you know one of the legal parts that we talked about with with uh, sessions um, and with with the uh, coal memorandum. There is also in the spending bill. There's a provision that says that the you know there's no money allocated for any prosecution of medical marijuana in any state that's um, organized, and so that's that's going to be a good thing. Um, I think that the the market will grow when there's adoption in the marketplace. Um, one of the things that um, that you see is the the NFL just came out with something that said that um, that. They, they thought that they're still studying it, that they don't like it. Um, the NFL Retired Players Association, uh, Bob Schmidt is here, uh, who is the chairman of the board. And, um, you know, they, the, um, if there was some certification that could be out there, um, there's 22,000 retired NFL players that we could, we could bring um, the products to. And so uh, the Israeli, uh, work on um, education and, and um, you know clinical trials. They're doing some clinical trials over there for CTS, you know, which is a, a big NFL issue. There's a two billion dollar lawsuit there, and they're doing it for um, rugby players. And so it'll be adoptable um, once once they get through that. So some of these other countries, and um, you know, you you may want to do it in Uruguay. You may want to do some uh, research over there, and get some adoption from that. So it's, so it's a market that's, that once it's adopted, and if uh, someone like the NFL, the NFL Retired Players Association can adopt it, I think that that will change the entire game and the discussion. So but just real quick piggyback on that, uh, the NFL, a big opportunity there. Eugene Monroe is a retired NFL player, is a partner of ours, was the first active NFL football player to come out uh, in favor of it. Uh, yesterday on the, the panel of all the sports commissioners, Jim Gray asked a question about it. Uh, cannabis is not a big issue in some of all the other uh, professional sports because the injuries they don't sustain. But in the NFL, it's a big deal. And all these players are being pushed pills, literally. Um, but your question on data, which I think is a great question. So we study the data maniacally. I love data. That's what we know. Um, and that's what we like. Uh, and we think that this whole thing and studying that and understanding the data points to this tidal wave of demand of both illegal use, converting to legal that Brian talked about, and then brand new organic growth of people that are switching or hearing about cannabis for the first time as an alternative to the pharmaceutical, whether it's Oxycontin or Ambien or Dilaudin or uh, you know whatever, pain things after your knee surgery, that our patients are saying, you know what, I took a little oil under my tongue and I didn't need the medicine. And I didn't feel like a zombie. What do you think about it? And we're like, well, we're not doctors, but this is legal and you know. Uh, so at the macro level, 50 plus billion dollars, and we study the micro data. And so I can tell you in a state like Illinois, where we think the illegal market is $3 billion, that checks out on the population that comes from groups like MPP and DPA, the legal market is tracking at you know, 60, 70 million. So you have penetration of 2% from illegal, uh, from illegal to legal, only growing with organic growth behind it. And so we have that model set up for every state. And we understand, and you can track the data. Nobody's really doing it. There's no analysts, right? I mean, Cowan has a report, and a couple of Wall Street firms are starting to think about this. Uh, but state tax revenue shows you the data. And so as people start to do this, the data should come clear, and it should become more obvious and out of the opaque, you know, non-transparent world into the obvious. This is helping people, and there's monstrous demand. I My comment is my name was invoked. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry about that. Medical marijuana 
is a real opportunity for doing things in health, okay? We don't need to confuse it with THC. I'm not opposed. I'm telling you the focus we have with retired players is pain management. I've got several of my players that use it. They talk about reduced pain in their joints. They talk about sleeping better. We have some other people we're working with that have used it in cancer, excuse me. So we don't know the old benefits. One of the problems I have in this whole topic is there's such a stigma that this is dope, okay? Now, as a person who lives in Washington, makes his living in Washington, if we want to solve this problem, we got to go to Washington, okay? And we don't come there talking about money. You talk about health, okay? And you talk about children who have benefited from this. Because at the end of the day, that's the only way this is going to happen. Big Pharma doesn't want to see this happen. I'm sorry. It's not, it's not in their financial best interest. So if this is going to get done, it's going to need that kind of push and focus. And we need the research. We need the medical profession involved in this. I'm working with doctors from Harvard, from MD Anderson, from a lot of different well-recognized places but they're in the minority right now, okay? Without getting into the conspiracy of this whole process, if you wanna take it head on, you gotta go take them head on right down there on the Capitol steps. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. <clears throat> I think the, the slide, what's not indicative in this slide is the CBD market, um, also known as the hemp market. Um, you look at the pain management market and what CBD can actually do for pain management, and the pain management market is hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, and what this slide's not indicative, indicative of is the pain management of the use of CBD for pain management. Um, and I think if you look at hemp and what's happening with hemp, um, yeah, it, the, that market number is four times the size. Yeah, on, on, on the topic of, of research, what's interesting also from an investment point of view is because this was a forbidden product, almost nobody owns the intellectual property because there have not been clinical trials able to go through FDA. Actually, when you see some of the most advanced companies already have huge valuations, and it's simply because something that has a concrete and serious impact on health could not be registered before. So in terms of, of we are not a biotech investor, but in terms of biotech and health investment into going through the clinical trials and patenting the use of, um, of CBD in general for either pain relief or cancer or epilepsy is going to be a very uh, profitable business. I think it'll be interesting to see how the industry um, in the sector breaks out. I, there's, there's definitely a recreational sector and there's, there's investment for that. And then there's the health sector. Um, and I think far greater investment for that, more work to be done from that perspective. Um, but we'll start to see some subsectors break out, and it'll be really interesting to see what happens over the next 18 to 24 months with that. So, so we've talked about these opportunities um, in front of us, but what does market saturation look like? It's a long, long way ahead. <laughs> I think for, it oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no. It's, I think for the moment the problem is the opposite. When you look for you look at Canada, the first country to really go in, first big country to go and uh, fully legalize, they estimate the demand is around 500 tons. The current production capacity of all producers together is less than 40 tons. So you're really long, long time away from from market saturation. You have to catch up uh, in a huge way. I think in the states it's a little different because you're it's a commodity that's being traded within a state. <coughs> So you, you have to look at your market share, you have to look at indications that the state will allow you to prescribe for, um, and you see a flood of money coming into different states in, in grow houses and, and to grow the plant, and they have a, a, you know, a market share of maybe 15,000 patients. Your, your return on investment is not gonna happen anytime quickly with that. Um, for us in particular, it's about putting a product in the marketplace that can be replicated in different states, um, because at that point it's an end-use product. It's not just a flower, it's not a commodity, but it's an end-use product that can be used in multiple states. We heard from an audience member the importance of advocacy and also um, really taking this to our congressman and, and moving forward the dialogue. 
We have seen the success from collecting tax revenues in places like Colorado, which I think collected about $1.2 billion in taxes last year. What are the takeaways from the Colorado model that we can apply to other states, and what's the sort of advocacy that we can, look, that we can help drive forward as far as making sure that we are um, continuing the conversation and, and speaking to lobbyists and other people who can help us move the dialogue forward? Oh, in terms of public policy, there's no doubt that the, um, uh, forbidding this product for medical use makes no sense. It's really, it's really something that has to be lifted all around the world. If it can simply sort out any cases in any country, it has to be allowed under uh, strict prescription and under medical supervision. But that's something that doesn't make, make sense. Where we get into a bit more uh, philosophical political issues is on the recreational part. But the, the statistics show that the legalization, even of the recreational aspects, improve obviously uh, health since the product is a controlled one instead of something that has no, no quality control. Uh, it reduces the, the funds or the money going to illegal uh, organizations. And it allows, uh, obviously, tax receipt in order to maybe uh, fund education of, or treatment of addiction. So the statistic is relatively um, uh, clear. And actually, that's what driving a change in public opinion. I remember five years ago, there was almost no one place in the world where public opinion was favorable for legalization for, for any purpose. Now it's actually shifting the other way around. And when public opinion changes in a clear way, I think politicians are very quick at uh, catching that movement. You talked about quality control, and we've got someone who works with the actual um, production of um, edibles and, and other products um, to service a patient community. We've got someone who runs dispensaries. Talk to us a little bit more about how you guys think about quality, quality control and some of the questions in this space. So quality control is huge. If I could just one second on the, the gentleman that talked about medical research, we would love to sponsor and be involved in medical research. We're in Chicago. I went to Northwestern, UFC, Rush. Everybody, nobody will do it. We have capital. I mean, you're here at the Milken Institute. They are sponsoring young investigators in prostate cancer. They're making you know unbelievable investigations. We can't get anybody to do research. Literally, we have money. We can't figure it out. Um, so I'm sorry. Your question was oh, product quality control. So we are in the production. We're, we're in the manufacturing. We're growing thousands of plants in several different states. Um, and then that product is tested at third party, uh, state certified ISO, certain kinds of certifications for potency, for contaminants, for all kinds of different uh, things that should not be in medicine. Everything we sell is tested, it's labeled for potency, you know exactly what you're getting. This is dosage control. Like the old days of, of weed in a bag is over. Uh, I mean, I don't know how to kind of sort of keep saying that. Everything is tested. Lynn runs a business, uh, Mary's Medicinals, that we partnered with and bringing that brand to other places. This is dosage control. Okay, we have miners taking this. They have cerebral palsy. They're taking a one-to-one. -one. To me, this is a conversation that has to happen with research, but it's, it's, it's a little bit unfair to say THC is rec and CBD is medical. Okay? That's a little not fair. Uh, the biggest producing product is this one-to-one -one product that miners in the state of Illinois are taking that is solving them. We have mothers in tears calling me, literally. Um, and so there, I, I don't know, I'm not a doctor, but there's something to this that has to happen. So everything we sell is tested, labeled, third-party, totally quality control. We, we follow the same protocols. Um, most states you know, demand that you have third-party testing. We actually have um, in-house testing as well. So in every state that we operate, we have um, gas chromatography machines, we have HPLC machines, we do all of our own in-house testing um, to make sure that the product we're putting out is accurate and safe. Because like Ben said, we have two-year-old patients and 92-year-old patients that rely on our medicine um, to, to benefit them, and so it has to be accurately dosed and clean. And on the, on the, um, the medical research, there is a hospital here in, in LA, there's a, a group called Canakids, and the founder had um, her daughter was, oh, there she is, okay, great. Yeah, she had, you know, daughter, you could tell the story, but I'll, I'll tell it, tell, just let me know if I got it wrong. So, but your daughter was nine months old and, um, you know, brain tumor, wasn't, you know, had short, short duration to live, uh, eyesight, gonna be gone. Um, she's four years old now and she's running around and the other night we saw her and, and um, you know, full eyesight, um, full, full, um, you know, eating, um, very, very uh, adapted person and, you know, no post-traumatic stress syndrome from her, her uh, cancer uh, treatments. So, you know, congratulations on what That's you're doing. Incredible.
any, anybody who has money, you know, it sounds like it's a great, it's a. Doing the research, so we can Yeah. You have some money. Yeah. So, so it seems like there's been a, a lot of analysis in the space from capital, but the capital sat on the sidelines. What is your view into when this capital will actually go to work into cannabis? Well, I think if, if you look at the, uh, there's, a, there's a slide on um, the number of cannabis businesses. Obviously, there's been an enormous amount of capital put in, um, but it's, there's a um, total of uh, 21 to 33,000 um, facilities, ancillary, to infuse manufacturers, to cultivators, to testing labs, and so it's it's a business that's out there. But um, it's it's a business that because it's federally illegal, the um, the institutional investors will not invest in it. So it's really a private market, and so there's there's really an opportunity for private investors to get involved with this um, at at good valuations. And at the beginning of this, and um, so it's it's really uh, you know a little bit of the green rush with some you know you got to be careful where you're going. We we don't think capital is sitting on the sideline. We see it coming in big. That's great to hear. I mean, I, you know, the, the opportunity is too good. People are students of the market. Demand is going to meet supply, and it's tipped. So I mean, you have 28 states. You have hundreds of millions of dollars. I think it's 130 million in Colorado. States talking about, you know, in Illinois, they're talking about three, five hundred million dollars of revenue in the most upside-down financial state in the nation. Um, this is going to happen. States need the money. The capital is going to find it. We have an unbelievably unique opportunity because there's a forced federal moat around the business that no institutional money can come in here. Every time you invest somewhere, there's a little thing that says we're not going to do anything federally illegal, and so nobody can participate. Um, that's why it's slow to start. That's why there's no scale. And now you have massive investment coming in with innovation. Medical research will happen. This is just going to take time. Uh, and there'll be you know, new realities in the future, for sure. And what are things that you're particularly excited about? Is it the hardware? Is it the financial technology? Is it some of the ancillary businesses that can service the industry? I'm not smart enough to have any idea which vaporizer is going to be the thing. I don't know which slice of the pie to be in. I just want a big slice of pie. So <laughs> it's like you don't know. We, we really don't know. Flour has gone from 70, 80% of the market down to below 50 in certain places. The brand, I mean, we're huge believers in brands. He said 15, 20 years. I think it's sooner. We think Mary's is a real brand. That's why we're doing it. Um, and so, yeah. Great. And Juan, as a grower, tell us a little bit more about you, how you maintain the biodiversity of some of the different strains that you're growing. Is it very broad based or are you focused on some, some particular no. strains? First, I, I didn't understand half the words you said because I'm just an investor <laughs> in a, So no, I guess the, the quality control there has to be, has been implemented properly. Some of the advantages of, of Uruguay is that it's a place uh, suited for the natural production of commodities at a low cost. When, when we visit, for example, some of the facilities in Canada and, uh, and you go, uh, there's uh, two meters of snow and inside uh, a warm up uh, uh, greenhouse, you are producing plants. I mean, it, it sounds very unnatural. Naturally, the cost of production there is maybe 10 times more expensive than us. So we are some time away of that. But eventually, it's a commodity that can be grown everywhere. And the low cost producer is going to be the only one who survives on the growing side assuming no uh, regulatory barriers that can protect you. So I will, we, we are not sure about the time frame, but we can think uh, five, ten years from, from now it's going to be an international commodity on which certain countries specialize and produce a very low cost and, and high quality uh, product and, and which we are a consumer product like any, any other one or a medical product prescribed in certain conditions for certain diseases. But there's almost no doubt that that's happening. What is happening in three, five, 10, or 15 years is still um, an investment opportunity in a market size that is really gigantic. It's, it's difficult to, to think right now uh, any other industry that is going to have a certain growth to a certain volume of, uh, of, of what we are talking, talking about. That's, that's why it's so exciting to be involved in it. And I personally think that in the short term, all of them will benefit simply because the market is so much bigger than, than it. Everybody will need more vaporizers, more production, more uh, extracts, more medicinal use. 
So the, the growth and the numbers is going to, to be there. Whether some of the market caps already integrate a big part of that and there's some risk in it, it's, it's possible. You, you're talking today several billion dollar companies that have five, 10 million in revenues. But that's it's where the anticipation and the timing of things uh, gets into account. Great, and as we wind down here, I'd love to pause for a few questions. Thank you so much. Great panel today. Um, ben, you mentioned uh, that, you know, well, actually, Brian, you mentioned that, you know, California being the sixth largest economy. Uh, ben, you also talked about some of the challenges that we face in terms of the regulatory things. So being a native Californian and working with the L.A. gubernatorial situation, which we have a lot of positive, we have a great mayor, we have a lot of people, what would the suggestion be? So for someone who works in strategic communication like myself, um, you know, Bob, you said get to Washington, D.C. Well, if we can, you know, as there's that old saying, as goes California, so goes the country. Well, within the state, it's as goes Los Angeles, so goes California, and then we can maybe kick the stone down the road. Uh, so I'd love some of your suggestions for what we can do advocacy-wise to in enhance the communication, get the, what I find in California is people will listen. If you get the right information to the right person, they're on it. So what helped me with some, uh, some ideas in that space? Thank you. I, I personally think it's bringing, um, it's bringing the adult to the conversation. It's, it's so frustrating from our perspective um, when you see these groups coming down to Washington, D.C., and they have a big joint in their hands, right? And it, it, that does nothing for the movement of getting real medicine into the hands of people that need it. Um, so you bring real, bring an adult to the conversation, bring real medicine to the conversation, and educate. Ed it's, it's amazing still how many people are so uneducated about the use of cannabis. And it's not just THC or CBD. There's 72 other cannabinoids that have a ton of other medicinal benefits that people aren't even touching. CBN is one. PTSD patients and CBN is huge. It's education um, and bringing the adult to the conversation, in my personal opinion. I would totally agree. The one thing I would get is the data. Nobody has the, I mean, we're not operational in California, so I don't study this closely, but for example, how many dispensaries are in LA County, right? Pull up Weed Maps. It's a free app. You can look at it. There's probably three to 500, 200? 400. 400. Okay, I made that up. 400. How big is the market? <laughs> 500 million a billion dollars in this one county that's crazy so like talk to people who are mature adults who don't have stigmas who, who are coming in here on the facts so well, I sat in the milk and panel three years ago when they did cannabis and I heard one fact that made me go start this business and it was the following well two things one is if somebody if nobody had ever heard of Cheech and Chong or stoners or the Grateful Dead and any of that <laughs> and somebody came from Saturn with a cannabis plant and said here try this that person would win a Nobel Prize Straight up, that's stunning to me. Eliminate the opioids, and then I yeah. mean, it would be it would be staggering if you came from the Amazon, you emerge, and you said, "Wait a minute, doctors are for free giving these pills to people that are killing them." Thirty thousand in your country last year, and here's a plant that's been around for thousands of years that has never killed one person ever. That's a fact. Okay, you, you would, they would say you're crazy, you're corrupt, you're killing your society, and you guys are backwards. So what Lynn said earlier about having the ability to be a capitalist and really, really help the world and make people live longer and better is an unbelievable opportunity. We're excited about it. We wake up early to get to work. Uh, so I would get the data, all of it. Hi, I'm Brian Kessler. I was also at that meeting a few years ago with Ben. And this is wonderful, guys. Wonderful presentation. What we've done in strides from what we were three or four years ago to where we are today is great. I guess my question really, though, kind of spins back between medical and, and personal consumption. And we had a lot of conversations about medical today. But when you deal with the personal consumption side, it also is what you said earlier, where you're getting safe, regulated, control uh, product into the marketplace, into people's hands, which right now is being bought by a drug dealer where you have no idea what, where that's coming from. So I think I asked the question, what do you think we can do to kind of bridge this gap? And also I make the point that I think us as an industry really have to work together and find that common voice, find it across all platforms, both the medical and, and the personal consumption. Um, and we look forward to working together as a unit. Thank you, guys. Oh. One, for example, one interesting topic was when, when Uruguay was the first one to legalize recreation. Right now, it's the only example in the world. 
and the discussions were being held at Parliament, one of the big uh, questions on all the arguments for legalization was on which product do you put the line? Because all those arguments are also valid for cocaine, heroin, etc. A good product regulated, tax receipts, etc. And, and the, um, the big uh, idea there was uh, addiction, the level of addiction. <coughs> but there's a lot of addictive things that are legal. So it's, it's tough, but the key thing is where to put the line. Anyways, I'll speak loudly. Uh, my name is Jorge I'm the president and chairman of the Maryland Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Uh, so thank you for, for what you're doing. Uh, I've been following this, I think, since I was 15, because I'm always interested in why things are legal versus not uh, illegal. Uh, and um, we are actually involved in lobbying uh, Annapolis to include diversity, uh, because I don't know if you're familiar what happened. <laughs> Everybody who got a license was pretty much a white male. Um, that's, that's one issue. Um, so I want to offer our support, my personal support in, in, in DC since we're very close and, and we're very well connected with them. Uh, and really to change the narrative, I think it's shameful. Um, and, and we have to start talking in, in real terms and stop being uh, diplomats. It is shameful that it is illegal uh, when tobacco is legal and when alcohol is illegal. If you talk to a three or four year old and you present the facts, they're gonna get it like that. And we gotta be smarted. We're, we're, we're supposed to be leading the world in technology and innovation. Uh, and the fact that um, people are dying of opiate addictions and dying of uh, other drug addictions, it's just, it's just shameful. Um, second thing, what, what you mentioned, um, I do see the future as every small kid is gonna start taking a pill uh, to prevent diseases. Uh, for example, bladder cancer. Uh, when you get bladder cancer, it's pretty bad news. You're, you're pretty much gonna end up um, you know, dead if, if it's not detected early. Um, the biggest cause of bladder cancer, smoking cigarettes. You know what happens when you actually consume cannabis and smoke it or, or in, in, in any other way? your chances decrease 45%. So it prevents that cancer and it prevents other cancers. This was in urology, uh, uh, the urology journal in 2015, if you wanna look it up. Um, and I think it is a slippery slope to differentiate medical and I like to call it adult use. Um, I'm a branding guy and recreational goes into the way that, oh, that person just likes to have too much fun. Adult use, don't mess with me, I'm an adult, I can you know, do whatever I want, right? Um, but um, also like, like you mentioned, there are so many variations of, of, um, of the actual flower of THC, there's uh, cis uh, and trans tetrahydrocannabinols, and they go from one to 12, 13, et cetera. Um, you know, although, although the medical use is, is very clear as well, uh, we, we have to start talking in terms of the overall uh, plant and the benefits that, that they have in the industry. So, you know, thank you again, and, and uh, I hope that, you know, we, we can uh, get this thing going a lot faster than it's going right now. I don't know if we have time for one. One quick comment that that touched on that we didn't mention here that would be important is the social justice element of the cannabis movement, which is around adult use, but also decriminalizing. So think about this, the amount of the, the people, and there's a whole generation of people that have been sort of hampered in their, their opportunity set and it's young African-American males who get drug offenses. It's usually a minor marijuana offense. In the city of Chicago, a cop could say it smells like weed, and here I'm coming in, boom, strike one, strike two, you now can't get a job. You now have perpetuated a cycle of poverty and taken away some young individual's opportunity. There's a book called The New Dream Crow Laws, that's the war on drugs, that's what it's done. And so it's the recreation, I like adult use also, but it's also the decriminalizing and sort of lifting the barriers on a whole group of people. We applaud the governor in Maryland, what he's doing on that study. We think we want to open up opportunity for plenty of people there, and so that's great. Um, I would just like to comment. Um, my husband had open heart surgery um, in December. He was over at UCLA, and they started feeding him OxyContin. And so two days after open heart surgery, he walked out of the hospital because he said he didn't want to uh, get addicted to opiates. 
and I became the family pusher. And so I started going to the shops and I got him these little jelly edibles and he didn't need opiates whatsoever. And to think, open heart surgery? And all he had to do was have an edible and he's doing great. So I can't tell you how many wonderful things. And last but not least, I went to UCLA and I spoke to some people there to say, why don't you use this? This would be marvelous in the hospitals not to have people get addicted. And they had no interest whatsoever. And it's just shocking. So. It, it is shocking, and as we close out the panel, I want to thank my fellow panelists, and I also just want to share a personal anecdote of my own. Um, I lost my mother to cancer, and when she had her brain tumor, she actually also could not take the opioids that she was prescribed because it complicated her chemotherapy. Um, so personally, I want to thank you all for the work that you do because you're improving the quality of lives and you're saving lives. So thank you. Thank you.